Good evening. Great to be back doing a live. Uh, normally I do them on Wednesday nights, but I am breaking the habit because things keep being booked on Wednesday nights. And so let's do a Thursday. And I'm probably going to do next Thursday as well. So just watch this space for future events. I always give you a little bit of warning on the day to tell you what we'll be doing. So tonight, lovely to see you, Antoine, joining me and viewing all sorts. Great to see you here too. I'm going to be talking about miniatures and tiny people in literature. I got going down this route because I reread an amazing story which I had heard on the New Yorker Fiction podcast a few years ago and it's a story that really stayed in my mind partly because it was the first time I'd ever listened to the New Yorker Fiction podcast with Deborah Treesman and it's an absolutely brilliant podcast in which an author, a well-known author, chooses another well-known author's short story and reads that aloud uh, and then discusses it with Deborah Treesman. And the whole thing is just a joy to listen to. And the very first one I ever listened to was In the Reign of Harrod IV by Stephen Milhauser. And it's an absolutely fantastic story, which you must read. And if we have time this evening, I'm going to read you some of it or even all of it. So it's quite short. Um, it's about a sculptor, like it's only five to six pages long, a sculptor who is a miniaturist who creates works of art which he carves with tiny, tiny tools and they're so small that they initially are the size of a pea, then they're even smaller and they fit into a pinhead and then they're even smaller so he manages to fit a whole city inside a pinhead and so on and he gets increasingly obsessed with getting smaller and smaller and smaller and it's an amazing profound brilliant wonderful story rather in the vein of Italo Calvino his kind of story and this got me thinking about miniature people and miniature things in literature. And I'd love to know if you have any favorite miniature tiny people or tiny miniature items in the world of literature. Let me know if you do. And also, do you have any of you ever seen a tiny person in reality? I have not, but I have two people in my life who swear that they've seen tiny people. One of them was my great great grandmother who saw tiny people dancing around a tree in Devon in their back garden and she believed that story to her dying day and told every all her relatives about it. She thought that they were fairies, little people. Another person who has seen a tiny person is a really good friend of my dad's who once saw a tiny person about that big running across a um a scrapyard and she's absolutely convinced that that is true so i'm going to be talking about tiny people in stories and also tiny creations in stories tonight starting off with The Borrowers by Mary Norton, which is surely one of the most famous children's stories with tiny people in it. So the borrowers live in the secret places of quiet old houses behind the mantelpiece. We've probably all got some borrowers in our houses. Under the harpsichord, if you have such a thing, under the kitchen clock. They own nothing, borrow everything. So they're very green as well. And they think that human beings were invented just to do their dirty work. The heroine of the story is Ariete, and her father, Pod, was an expert borrower who could scale curtains using a hat pin and bring back a doll's teacup without breaking it. 
girls weren't supposed to go borrowing. Don't forget this was written in the ninth, early 20th century, about 1910. But as Ariete was an only child, her father broke the rule and then something happened which changed their lives. She made friends with the human boy living in the house. I think someone should write a modern day version of The Borrowers. Has anyone done that? I don't think they have. I think it'd be great if they did. So Mary Norton, the author, was born in 1903 and she was brought up in a house in Bedfordshire, which was to become the setting for The Borrowers, which was first published in 1952 and was an immediate, immediate success. There were then four more Borrowers books and they were very much a part of my childhood. I wonder if any of you read them as a child. There's also been uh, various film adaptations of the book. So that is The Borrowers. They're maybe the first tiny people that come to mind for me when I start thinking about tiny people. But other tiny people that come to mind are Tom Thumb and Thumbelina, who are ancient English um, legends of tininess. Antoine Lorraine is here this evening. I wonder if you have any tiny people in French lore who might be different to the ones that we have. Do let me know. If so, I'd love to know if you have legendary tiny people in French fairy tales. So Tom Thumb is a character of English folklore who was meant to be the size of a thumb. The history of Tom Thumb was first published in 1621 and it was the first ever fairy tale printed in English. Tom is no bigger than his father's thumb and his adventures include being swallowed by a cow, tangling with giants and becoming a favourite of King Arthur. It often seems to be the case that tiny people become the favourites of the king or queen, more of which later. The earliest allusions to Tom occur in various 16th century works, such as Reginald Scott's Discovery of Witchcraft, 1584, where Tom is cited as one of the supernatural folk employed by servant maids to frighten children. There's a place in Lincolnshire, England, called Tatters Hall, which reputedly is where Tom Thumb lived died and was buried and there's a grave of Tom Thumb in Tattershall which is quite an amazing thought. Uh, the um, legend has it that Tom Thumb might have been a real person born around 1519 and there's a grave with his name on it which is set into the floor in Tattershall adjacent to the font of the main chapel of the Holy Trinity Church in Lincolnshire and the inscription reads, Tom Thumb, here lies Tom Thumb, age 101, died 1620. The grave measures just 40 centimetres in length. Pretty amazing. So maybe he actually was a real person. There's also uh, Thumbelina, who we'll come to in a minute. I'll just give you a little bit more of the story of Tom Thumb because it is a great story. And there's an amazing amount of uh, fantastic folklore around him and Thumbelina. Actually, I'm going to move on to Thumbelina because I realise we're going to run out of time with all these great stories of tiny folk. So Thumbelina's story begins with a woman yearning for a child who asks a witch for advice. We always know that's a bad idea if you live in the 17th century. And she is presented with a barley which she's told to go home and plant. And sometimes it's a barley corn, which she's given in exchange for food. After the barley corn is planted and sprouts, a tiny girl named Thumbelina, the size of a thumb again, or slightly smaller, because she is found asleep in her walnut shell cradle. So that's even smaller. She's carried off by a toad who wants her as a bride for her son. There's a lot of quite interesting, um, peculiar cross-species marital concern going on. Antoine, thank you for your thoughts on French folklore. 
Uh, Antoine says that French literature is not so much involved in imagination and more or less in humour. I'm an exception. Ah, oh, that's uh, very interesting to hear. I wonder if there are any French fairy tales out there. Maybe I'm going to research, Antoine, and come back to you. And that is very interesting what you say, that French literature is not so much involved in imagination and more and less in humour. Um, by the way, Antoine has a new book out, which I've been trying to listen to um, as an audio book. And for some reason, I could not. This is a terrible confession, Antoine. Sorry to make it here. I didn't fall in love with the uh, narrator. And I love all your books. And I love to listen to audiobooks. But I'm now going to get the book as a physical book and read it uh, because that would be ob the obvious and natural thing to do. The name of the book in English is An Astronomer in Love. I hope I've got that right. Um, so I recommend to everyone who's listening tonight to also get that book and then we could all talk about it on another evening, which would be fantastic. Uh, so moving back to Tom Thumb, Thumbelina and Very Small People. Uh, we were saying that Thumbelina is born, she sprouts from a um, barley corn and she is attempt all these animals attempt to seduce her in rather awful and embarrassing ways so first there's a toad then there's a frog then there is a mole who wants her to be his bride and all the while Thumbelina is actually talking to a swallow and the swallow is actually in love with her and he also it turns out wants her to be his bride but Thumbelina keeps resisting all these worrying cross species, amicable intents, until eventually she does meet her true love, which is a flower fairy prince, which is clearly far more what we uh, what we would rather she ended up with, because we would rather that she doesn't end up marrying a mole for instance that just seems a bit wrong and she always hates the idea of going and living under a tunnel and never seeing the sunlight which is perfectly fair and the poor swallow is heartbroken the swallow's been helping her all the time to try and survive her life as a tiny person and he goes off with a broken heart poor swallow but the lovely Thumbelina ends up with the flower fairy prince, so all is well. So that's Thumbelina, another very famous and brilliant uh, common fairy tale about a tiny, tiny person. One of the most uh, famous stories about tiny people that surely must be mentioned is Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift, which was published in 1726. So in that book, when our hero, Gulliver, goes forth in search of adventure, one of the first adventures that he has is to be taken by the Lilliputians, who are a race of tiny, tiny, tiny people. And Gulliver washes up on their shores. And as he finds himself uh, being swept by the sea on a raging storm, a bit like we've been having here and in France in the last few days. Um, Gulliver drinks lots of whiskey, as you do, while he's battling through the waves. And when he arrives on the Lilliputian shore, he falls asleep in a bit of a drunken stupor, only to wake up being completely tied down by tiny, tiny cords of rope which prevent him from moving. And he is then in thrall to the Lilliputians who become his uh, masters, really. And the Lilliputians are a satirical look from Jonathan Swift at people who are full of arrogance and puffed up 
uh, absurdities of life, they are representing all the bad things about aristocratic life in in the terms of um, Jonathan Swift. So they show off not only to Gulliver, but to themselves as well. There is no mention of armies proudly march marching in any of the other societies that Gulliver visits, only in Lilliput and neighbouring Blefescu are the six-inch inhabitants possessed of the need to show off their patriotic glories with displays of army violence. So the Lilliputian emperor asks Gulliver to serve as a kind of makeshift arch of triumph for the troops to pass on to pass under and at one point Gulliver has to pee on a fire in order to put it out so he's actually subjected to quite a lot of ridicule embarrassment and shame when he spends time with the Lilliputians in contrast to when he hangs out with the Brobdingnagians, who are giants, and they're actually awful in completely different ways. So he's enthralled to these tiny, tiny Lilliputians who are pretty unbearable and full of themselves for a quite long chapter of the book. Oh, and I do have Gulliver's Travels somewhere. Here it is. I've got quite a lovely old version of it from my parents. I wonder, oh, look at that. I wonder if any of you have read Gulliver's Travels in recent years. Because people think that it's a children's book. Au contraire, it's actually very much a satirical book about politics and about the state of the British nation at the time when Jonathan Swift wrote the book. But look at this, isn't it a gorgeous book? I am very glad that I rescued that from my parents' library. So uh, Gulliver, he spends lots of time with the Lilliputians who are tiny. He then spends time with the Brobdingnagians who are the giants. And they're awful because he witnesses all kinds of things that he would never normally witness as a member of society if he was the same size as everyone else because he is taken around as a bit of a pet he sits in the bosom of one of the women that looks after him and he's confronted with a horrifying wart which is obviously as big as his head if not bigger with hairs growing out of it it's all really disgusting and he really Jonathan Swift really revels in the horror of everything that you see when Gulliver becomes the tiny, tiny person in contrast to the Brobdignagians, who are the giants. So rather like Alice in Wonderland, Gulliver gets to be both the tiny one and the enormous one. And he sees lots of amazing different perspectives from his different sizes, very much like um, Alice in Wonderland too. And Antoine, I'm glad that you're a fan of Gulliver's Travels. It is indeed a very political and subversive book and everyone should actually read it. If you haven't read it yet, get it out and, and read it now because it is absolutely brilliant. And Jonathan Swift was a pretty amazing writer with lots of other fantastic books as well. It might seem initially a little bit turgid because it is written in the language of your but you will definitely get sucked into the story and to the brilliance of it and also people that don't know it might uh, be quite entertained by the huonims who are the horses in the book and also the yahoos who are the um the humans who are a kind of rather demoralized and ape-like version of humanity which Jonathan Swift is saying is maybe what we're like. Um, Hal's Bells is mentioning that the white cat French fairy tale has someone looking for the smallest dog. Interesting. Oh, I'll have to hear more about that. Thank you for that comment. So um, just to say a little bit more about Jonathan Swift as well, one of the other groups of people that Gulliver meets is the Laputans, who 
have mastered all kinds of technological innovations, rather like we have with our iPhones and our seeming technical brilliance. But they have a lot of things wrong with their society. So the Laputans have mastered magnetic levitation and discovered the two moons of Mars, which in reality would not be discovered for another 150 years. However, they're unable to construct well-designed clothing or buildings because they take measurements with instruments such as quadrants and a compass rather than with tape measures. Laputa is a male-dominated society, not surprisingly. Wives often request to leave the island to visit the land below because the Laputan island is a floating island. However, these requests are almost never granted because the women who leave Laputa never want to return. I wonder why. Laputa is more complex than Lilliput or Brobdingnag because its strangeness is not based on differences of size but on the primacy of abstract theoretical concerns over concrete practical concerns in Laputan culture. But physical power in Laputa is important, as in Lilliput and Brobdingnag. Um, here, power is exercised not through physical size, but through technology. The government floats over the rest of the kingdom, using technology to gain advantage over its subjects. The floating island is both a formidable weapon and an allegorical image that represents the distance between the government and the people it governs. So there you go with another interesting society represented in Gulliver's Travels, which is not just about the little people, but it does very much comment on what it's like to be a different size in society and who's got the power. And actually, I must just briefly digress into Naomi Alderman's book, The Power, which is another one which makes comments about physical strength and power, giving you a very different sense of your own place in the world. So that's not about size, which is what we're talking about tonight, but it is about having a kind of strength. And in the power, the women have an ability to shoot out electrical volts or jolts, a bit like lightning bolts, through which they are able to fight back against men, be stronger than men, and eventually subjugate men as well. So it all becomes quite sinister and brilliant. That's the power. Uh, Naomi Alderman's got a new book out as well. I think it's called The Future, which I haven't read yet, and I'm excited to read it. So another fascinating book, which has little people in it, is 1Q84 by Haruki Murakami, which is a very big fat book. It's actually three volumes, but it is now published in one fat tome. And I totally recommend it as a brilliant read. I do love Murakami. I've read most of his books. I haven't read his most recent ones, actually, but I don't love all of them as much as each other. But this one is definitely up there could be my actual favourite. I also do love um, Kafka on the Shore, which is brilliant. Um, and The Wind Up Bird Chronicle, which is fantastic too. So this book, it's very long. It's very big. It's got a lot going on. But it's very romantic. It is a book with a lot of romantic love in it. Also a lot of darkness. There's a lot of sinister stuff going on. So it was published between 2009 and 10 in three volumes, set in Tokyo in an alternate version of the year 1984, which is why it's called 1Q84, because the heroine realises that she is living in an alternate version of 1984. So the Q in 1Q84 is the question what is going on in this universe that she finds herself in, in this kind of parallel world. So it's a reality-bending novel 
which explores star-crossed lovers Almane and Tengo's involvement with a mysterious cult. There are references to George Orwell's 1984 abounding throughout the book. Uh, the three volumes of the book, although it was originally published separately, do all flow on from each other and completely continue the narrative thread, though it's also told from different points of view. We have Almami, who's a personal trainer, um, Tengo, an aspiring novelist, and in the third volume, we have uh, Ushikawa, a private detective. Chapters alternate alternate between the protagonist's perspectives. Antoine, I'm sensing that you might not be a lover of Murakami, and you're asking me why I love him. That is a very interesting question. I love the worlds that he creates because they are so different and so fascinatingly slightly bent out of shape from the world that we live in. The first one I read was uh, Haruki Murakami's Wind Up Bird, sorry, Wind Up Bird Chronicle. Oh, you do like him, good. So, <laughs> but yeah, well, so you're asking me in a positive way. So I love the way he takes you just in a sidestep into a different universe, into a different version of reality, like in the Wind Up Bird Chronicle, when the central character goes down into the well and starts having all these kind of hallucinations and kind of living in different realities and going through the wall of the well into a whole new world. I just love that idea that that could actually happen and maybe it could. And furthermore, in this one, there's all sorts of pretty crazy things that happen. So there's an alternate universe just connected with us, where there, there are two moons in the, in the sky. There's also the little people who appear in our reality uh, and they are very mysterious. I've actually been thinking about them a lot today while wondering about uh, the idea of the little people to be discussed this evening. And there's no real answer to what the little people represent. They could be a kind of collective unconsciousness of humanity. They, in a way, do represent the dark side of humanity because seemingly the little people in 1Q84 are urging or making this cult leader, who's one of the main characters, who gets killed in a dramatic way without giving things away too much. Um, he's making this man sleep with 10 year old girls, basically rape 10 year old girls, which is a horrific concept. And the little people seem to be making that happen. So the little people are not benign. The little people are more like kind of imps or bad fairies. And the reason I love Murakami as well as him having all this darkness is because he does have a lot of light and joy and romance and there's a happy ending which is always a good thing uh not in all his books though quite a lot of his books end in a rather ambiguous way so he doesn't always tie up those loose ends it has to be said he is a mysterious writer and I do feel he's someone who's great to read just um, in in chunks. So read one of his books, have a year reading lots of other people's books, then read another Murakami. Don't read them all in one go. I have met some people that have because they love him and they've ended up reading all of his oeuvre um, one after the next. But I do feel they rather kind of slip into each other and... I think they're much better digested if you read them with gaps in between. So, yeah, it's a good question, though. Why do people love Murakami? I wonder if, uh, Antoine, have you read his latest book? And if so, what do you think? And also his, his um, memoir, 
which is uh, what I think about when I think about running, which I do love. But I wonder if people who aren't runners or writers might not love it so much. Anyway, it is a book that I prescribe to people quite a lot who do love running and writing. Uh, literary runners, of which there are many out there, but I think there's a lot of people that like him too who aren't runners. So the little people in Haruki Murakami's IQ84 are a mysterious group of beings who live in an alternate world parallel to the one in which the human characters reside. They're described as small childlike creatures with large eyes and pointed ears. They're known for their ability to manipulate reality and control the thoughts and actions of humans, which is why they're so sinister. The significance of the little people in the novel, according to some sources, lies in the role they play in the main characters' lives. They're a symbol of the power of the imagination and the ability of the mind to shape reality as the characters in the novel struggle to determine what's real and what's not. Additionally, the little people's ability to control the thoughts and actions of the human characters can be seen as a commentary on the power of manipulation and control in human relationships. So Hal's Bells is just saying, The Secret of the Blue People is a Japanese book about the little people living on the shelf in a library who are looked after by the family by being given a blue glass of milk. That's really interesting. Oh, I really want to discover that book. Thank you for that. I'm going to look for that. The Secret of the Blue People. I wonder if Haruki Murakami got any of his ideas from that book. It sounds like maybe it might be an idea that's part of the Japanese psyche. The Secret of the Blue Glass. Oh, thanks for that. That's a that's a really great addition to our collection of books about the little people. So I'm now going to move on to another very different author who also wrote about miniature things, which is Jesse Burton, who wrote The Miniaturist, and that was an enormous success and was made into a really brilliant TV adaptation in three parts, which I actually think took the book to new heights because it was a really fantastic interpretation of the book. And this was Jessie Burton's first book. She went on to write some other excellent books, including The Muse and The Confession, both of which I think are fab. Plus, uh, she wrote the sequel to The Miniaturist, which is The House of Fortune. So the the reason to mention this, it's not about little people, but it's about someone who creates tiny things, uh, who is the miniaturist in this novel. And Jesse Burton was inspired to write it by visiting Amsterdam and seeing the real doll's house of the real Petronella Oortman, who was a person that lived in Amsterdam in 1686. And she was really given this amazing doll's house, which I have also seen and had the joy of visiting in Amsterdam, which I would thoroughly recommend if any of you get the chance to do so. So the doll's house, most of us imagine doll's houses nowadays to be quite small, maybe the size of something that would fit easily on your desk. But Nella Petronella Ortman's doll's house is huge. It's probably as big as that entire bookcase behind me. And it stands on big legs so that you can fit in a lot. And each room is also quite a big room. So in fact, the miniatures are not totally miniature. They're nowhere near as miniature as the tiny creations in the story in here that I'm going to tell you about later, they're more like probably Tom Thumb size miniature creations. And just to give you a little bit of the story, if you don't know it, uh, Patronella Ortman, she's 18, living in a small town, 
Her late father squandered the family's wealth and she makes an arranged marriage to Johann Brandt, who's 39, rich, respected and an Amsterdam merchant. But we slowly realise that all is not as it seems in the world of Johanna because Johannes, because he refuses to consummate their marriage and instead he gives his new wife an amazing doll's house to play with, which is obviously not quite the same. And one of the things that he says is that she can fill it with whoever she would like to. So she commissions this mysterious miniaturist to populate the doll's house with people from her life. And she sends forth to the miniaturist without ever actually meeting the person that is the miniaturist. And I don't want to give anything away, so I won't say too much about that person. And slowly, mysterious, tiny, seemingly prophetic versions of reality turn up at her door, wrapped up in a little piece of cloth. They arrive on the doorstep and they weirdly relate to the reality of her life. So a, a little tiny baby turns up on the doorstep, but she hasn't had sex with her husband. So where is this baby going to come from? She asks herself, as do we, the readers. Um, there's also various other aspects of her daily life, which are reflected in the creations that the miniaturist comes up with, one of which is a dog, one of which is a little tiny version of herself, and so on. So the, the miniaturist in this book is a kind of prophetic seer who seems to be predicting what's going to happen in the life of Nella Ortman. And this continues throughout the whole book. And the miniaturist remains a mysterious person to the very end. And even in the next book, the sequel, The House of Fortune, the miniaturist continues with the strange events that are unfolding by leaving these interesting aspects of Nella's life at her door. Uh, and we never really know, without completely ruining the story, who the miniaturist is and why they do it, which I did actually find really frustrating. Throughout the whole book, I was dying to find out who this miniaturist was. And we never really do, which is pretty frustrating, Jesse Burton. I wonder if one of these days you might tell us who the miniaturist actually is. Maybe there'll be a third in the series. That would be fun, because I do think that Jesse Burton gets better and better. So before the last story, which I'm going to come to very soon, I really wanted to mention another lovely book about a tiny person, which is The Smallest Man by Francis Quinn. Unfortunately, I don't have a physical copy because I listened to it on audio, so I can't show it to you. But it was described as the feel-good novel of 2020. It was a really great read. And it's about a very small man, about, I think he's meant to be about two foot tall. So he's not as tiny as some of the six inch people that we're talking about tonight, uh, called Nat Davy, who was based on a real person called Jeffrey Hudson. And Nat Davy, in the year 1625, was sold to uh, somebody who eventually brought him to the new Queen of England. He was given as a gift to Henrietta Maria, who was married to Charles I. And Henrietta was the new Queen of England. She was given Nat Davy as a gift, sold by his own father. So Nat Davy, in the first section of the book, we see him as a young lad growing up very close to his brother, um, seemingly happy, trying to fit in with the other boys at school or boys in his village, not at school, because um, he's a working lad and wouldn't have actually gone to school. And however, he's never going to grow any taller than about 20 inches high. So 
he's clearly not fitting in. And then his dad sells him. And then his life changes and off he goes to be with the Queen. And here's a little bit of what he says at the beginning of the book. The year of 1625 it was when a shingle, single shilling changed my life. That shilling got me taken off to London, where they hid me in a pie of all things, so I could be given as a gift to the new Queen of England. They called me the Queen's Dwarf, but I was more than that. I was her friend when she had no one else, and later on when the people of England turned against their king, it was me who saved her life. When they turned the world upside down, I was there, right at the heart of it, and this is my story. Inspired by a true story, the story of Geoffrey Hudson, and spanning two decades that changed England forever, The Smallest Man is a heartwarming tale about being different, but not letting it hold you back. And it is a really lovely, as we say, feel-good story. Uh, I hugely enjoyed it. I read it during lockdown, I do believe. And it was one of those stories that really cheers the heart. It is based on truth, but definitely manipulated a bit to have a more positive bent than what really happened to Geoffrey Hudson, who would be a really fascinating person to find out more about. And there's also a love story within the book because Nat Davy is in love with a woman uh, and I won't tell you what happens. So it's very much an upbeat, positive tale where the smallest man, who is indeed a tiny man, has all sorts of fantastic feats. And one of the most fun passages that I really loved is when he learns to ride a horse and Nobody thinks he's ever going to be able to ride a horse because he's way too small, but he is determined to conquer and to stand up to the bullies who say that he's never going to be able to manage it. And verily, he does overcome his um, natural difficulties. And it's a lovely story. Frances Quinn, she's a great writer, um, very fun. And she's written a new book, came out in 2022, which is called The Bone Setter, something about The Bone Setter. Um, and I haven't read it yet, but everyone says it's great. So one to look to watch out for. So moving on finally to the story that got it all started, which is called In the Reign of King Harrod IV by Stephen Milhausen, who is a really unusual, brilliant, strange, interesting writer, American. I'm pretty sure he's won the Pulitzer Prize. Indeed he has. Uh, hailed by the New Yorker as a virtuoso of waking dreams. This is a collection of short stories by him called Dangerous Laughter. And I can really recommend the title story too, which is all about a load of teenagers having these laughing parties which become something more sinister than just laughter. They're all quite peculiar, definitely slightly Italo Calvino kind of vibes, also slightly Ian McEwan in a way with their with their darkness, thinking of Ian McEwan's short stories, some of which are similarly a bit weird and worrying and go into the realms of possible fantasy. Um, anyway, I'm going to read you some of the story. There's probably not time for the whole thing. In the reign of King Harrod IV. In the reign of Harrod IV, there lived at court a maker of miniatures who was celebrated for the uncanny perfection of his work. Not only were the objects of his strenuous art pleasing to look at, but the pleasure and astonishment increased as the observer, bending closer, saw that a passionate care had been lavished on the smallest and least visible details. It was said that no matter how closely you examined one of the master's little pieces, you always discovered some further wonder. Among the many tasks of the maker of miniatures, 
was supplying court ladies with carved ivory plants and triple-headed sea monsters for their cabinets of delight, drawing the fur and the fur and feathers of fabulous creatures in the Book of 300 Secrets, and above all, replacing the furnishings of the old toy palace, when the king had inherited from his father, and which was filled with mouldering draperies and cracked wood. The famous toy palace, with its more than 600 rooms, its dungeons and secret passageways, its gardens and courtyards and orchards, rose to the height of a man's chest and occupied its own chamber across from the king's library. In return for his duties, the maker of miniatures was given a private apartment in the palace, not far from the court carpenter, as well as an ermine robe that entitled him to take part in official ceremonies. He was assisted by two youthful apprentices. They roughed out the larger miniatures, such as cupboards and canopy beds, fired the little earthenware bowls in a special kiln, applied the first coat of lacquer to objects made of wood, and saved precious time for the master by fetching from the palace workshops pieces of ivory, copper, lapis, boxwood and beechwood. But the apprentices were not permitted to attempt the more difficult labours of the miniaturist art, such as carving the dragon heads at the feet of table legs or forging the minuscule copper keys that turn the locks of drawers and chests. One day, after the completion of an arduous and exhilarating task, he had made for one of the miniature orchards a basket of brilliantly lifelike red and green apples, each no larger than the pit of a cherry, and as a finishing touch he had placed on the stem of one apple a perfectly reproduced copper fly. The maker of miniatures felt in himself a stirring of restlessness. It wasn't the first time he had experienced such stirrings at the end of a long task, but lately the odd internal itching had become more insistent. As he tried to penetrate the feeling, to reveal it more clearly to himself, he thought of the basket of apples. The basket had been unusually satisfying to make because it had presented him with a hierarchy of sizes, the basket itself composed of separate slats of boxwood bound with copper wire, then the apples, and at last the fly, the tiny fly, with its precisely rendered wings, had caused him the most difficulty and the most joy, and it occurred to him that there was no particular reason to stop at the fly. Suddenly he was seized by an inner trembling. Why had he never thought of this before? How was it possible? Didn't logic itself demand that the downward series be pursued? At this thought he felt a deep, guilty excitement, as if he'd come to a forbidden door at the end of a private corridor, and heard, as he slowly turned the key, a sound of distant music. So this is from In the Reign of Harrod the Fourth by Stephen Mel Melhausen uh, for people joining now. Megan, great to see you here. Uh, and it's about a miniaturist, a man that makes miniatures in the reign of Harold the Fourth, who we never we never know who that is, but one has a bit of an oriental kind of feel to the story. And the reason I love this story and keep going back to it is because the miniaturist, the man who is creating art is very happy creating his fabulous art for the king and the courtiers, but he suddenly feels unsatisfied with what he's created and he wants to create something even more miraculous, even more beautiful, even more stunning, that's going to elicit even more gasps of astonishment from the viewers by the brilliance of his incredible craftsmanship. And the sculptor continues to keep creating more and more tiny and intricate and unbelievably miraculous pieces of art until nobody can actually see them at all, which of course has a bit of an, of an emperor's new clothes kind of attitude to the tale, but we know that the miniaturist is creating real 
sculptures he's not making it up they're not literally invisible they really are there and he's using tiny tiny tools at one point a week's work that he's created which is so tiny that it fits inside the eye of a needle gets blown away by a gust of wind and so our poor miniaturist has to create a special box with tiny tiny tools where he can create ever more intricate and amazing and breathtaking pieces of art. He is an artist in the truest sense of the word. He wants to create things purely for the joy of them being miraculous, amazing and brilliant. But he does also want the breaths of astonishment from the people that see them. And you've got to read the story to know what happens. I will read you a little bit more. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's a bit too long. But I would totally recommend getting this collection of Stephen Milhausen stories and finding your way to In the Reign of Herod the Fourth. And also reading the others while you're at it, particularly Dangerous Laughter, which is a really fantastic story. Also, you could listen to the New Yorker Fiction Podcast, which is fantastic. And you can find this very story in their archive. So I'm going to read you one other little bit. because I don't want to totally give everything away. So I won't read you the very ending. Even as he sank deeply into his little world, he felt at the back of his mind a slight itching, as if he knew that his palace, even that, could not satisfy him for very long. For such a feat, however arduous, was really no more than the further conquest of a familiar realm, the twilight realm of the world, revealed by his glass, and he yearned for a world so small that he could not yet imagine it. As he worked on his palace, the craving grew in him, and he seemed to sense dimly, just out of reach beyond his inner sight, a further kingdom. See, every time he creates something, he wants to create something even more miraculous and something he can't even yet imagine. He began to see it more clearly with growing excitement, though he confessed to himself that it was less of a seeing than a desire gradually hardening into a certainty. Although he now worked with materials so minute that it was invisible to the unaided eye, it remained true that the invisible was made visible by his lens. If to others he seemed a magician who brought the seen out of the unseen, in fact he worked wholly in the visible world. It was an ambiguous and elusive world which vanished into the invisible as soon as the glass was removed. And yet it was a far cry from the purely invisible realm he sensed just beyond. And he longed to construct objects so small that they would escape the power of the mediating glass, remain submerged in the dark kingdom of the invisible. So I'm going to leave it there and let you all discover the brilliance of that story, because it really is one of those stories that you will keep going back to and trying to extract the meaning from it. But I do find it incredibly inspiring because it is about art and creativity and why we create and why we can't stop ourselves creating and why we must create ever more brilliant, magical, ephemeral, beautiful creations. Uh, so on that note, I will leave you for tonight. But thanks so much for coming. It's been lovely to see you. And I do feel that it would be rather great next week if I maybe did something ghostly, seeing as it is the season of ghostliness. We've just had Halloween. It's very dark, All Souls Night. Uh, it's that period between autumn and Christmas when everything is rather dark and ghostly and we want to light our candles make pumpkin soup, carve pumpkins, look out through their eyes. And by the way, do check out uh, my art class on my Elibertu paintings Instagram, because I've been getting them to paint uh, 
as if they are coming out of the inside of pumpkins. So that's the other side of my life as an artist and art teacher. Um, I've been also thinking about the idea of being the king of infinite space, like Hamlet, uh, though bounded by a nutshell, or maybe bounded by a pumpkin. So check out those really fantastic paintings that people have been doing in my art class. I was very impressed with what their imaginations brought forth. And I'm going to be doing a few more tomorrow. So um, do follow my Ella Bertu paintings account as well, where I put paintings by my art students and also by me. So thanks so much for joining this evening. If any of you have any further miniature thoughts, I'd love to know what books you particularly love, which have tiny people in them that I might not have mentioned. So we had the Borrowers, we had Tom Thumb and Thumbelina, we had um, Gulliver's Travels, uh, The Smallest Man by Francis Quinn, and of course, 1Q84, and Stephen Milhausen. I'll do a little post with all the titles of the books on it, The Miniaturist as well. So a really fantastic collection. And I'd also love to see any artworks that people might have relating to miniatures. Min pins, says Hal Spells. Um, I don't know the min pins. I'm going to have to look, look them up. I feel like I might be missing out in a major way from the min pins. Uh, I'm going to be looking at them at the end of this session. So thanks so much for coming, everyone. Great to see you and see you next week. I'm hoping to do next Thursday because there's another event happening on a Wednesday, so I can't come to it. So watch this space. See you next week. Au revoir. Bonsoir. À la prochaine fois. Good night.